Hi, I'm Cal Van Doren. I'm a corporate systems engineer here at AGI. And today I'm going to walk you through how you can insert uh, comets or asteroids directly into SDK using the JPL Horizons interface. This is in light of recent events. We have NEOIs with a close approach coming up just this week. And so I'm going to show you how you can do your own analysis with any comet or asteroid. So the first place we're going to start is from an FAQ on the AGI website. The link to this FAQ will be in the description of this video. Um, the first thing we're going to do is open up the JPL Horizons web interface. So I'm going to do that by following this link here. Once we're here, now all of my settings have already been set from the last time I used this, but I'm going to walk you through how you can do it from default. So the first thing you're going to do is change the ephemeris type. Um, it should be normally set as observer table. We're going to change that to vector table. Click use, use selection above. We're going to change the target body to whatever body you're looking to insert into SDK. For me, that's going to be the NEOWISE comet. And of course, NEOWISE is just the name of the telescope that discovered the comet. Um, but we're going to use the C2020F3 NEOWISE comet. And click insert. The coordinate origin for us will be geocentric. And when you hit enter, that'll automatically populate there. Next thing we're going to do is change the time span. Now, you can use whatever time span you'd like for your SDK scenario. Um, but I'd recommend that you choose a time span in the JPL tool that will match that, or at least encompass all of it. So for me, I'm going to do the 27th of March, which was when this uh, comet was first discovered. And I'm going to end it on the 1st of September. And I'm going to use the step size of one day. I don't want an eph ephemeris that's too large, especially um, with this large of an orbit. So I'm going to use those specified times. Now, next we're going to go into table settings. Um, the first thing you need to change is this type up here. We're going to change to a type 2 state vector that'll give us position and velocity. Next thing we're going to do is change the output units to kilometers and kilometers per second for velocity. Reference plane will be Earth mean equator. We're going to use the J2000 reference system. Um, aberrations you should not need to change. What you will need to do is uncheck this delta T box that comes checked. You will need to check the CSV format box and then uncheck the object page box. From here, that's all of our table settings. Now, finally, you'll just choose how you want this file to be saved. Um, the best thing that I would recommend is just download and save. So from here, we can go ahead and click Generate Ephemeris. That'll download a text file that we'll use to read into SDK with our custom UI plugin. Now, going back to the FAQ, the next thing we can see we need to do is unzip the JPL Horizons Ephemeris file. Um, that'll be the UI plugin that we're going to use to load our comet or asteroid. You can find that just at the bottom of the FAQ here. Um, go ahead and download it. I've already done that for the sake of time. Now, this will be a link to a, another FAQ that'll help us register our .wsc type plugin. Um, this is an important step so that SDK can recognize the plugin and that we can actually use it within SDK. So as you can see here, the first step that we're going to do um, is move the XML file from, or from where we downloaded the JPL Horizons Ephemeris UI plugin, and that's right here. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this file. For you, it's wherever you downloaded it to. And then we're going to move it to our SDK install directory. And within the SDK in install directory, there's a plugins folder, and that's where we're going to want to put this XML file. So I'm going to do that now. For most users, that's going to be in your C drive under Program Files, AGI, whatever version of SDK you're using. For me, it's SDK 12, and then Plugins. I'm going to go ahead and paste that file here. Now I need to give administrator permissions here. Most users won't have to do that, but if you're not logged in as the administrator on your own computer, you will need to do this. OK, now you can see I have the JPL Horizons File Reader XML here. That means that SDK will recognize this plugin when I open up SDK. So the next step that we need to do is we need to register this UI plugin. What you're going to have to do is open up a PowerShell or a command prompt. Um, again, if you're not the administrator on your computer right now, you're going to have to run that PowerShell as the administrator, um, which I have already done here. Then what we're going to do is we're going to CD or change direct directory over to where we downloaded this UI plugin. And of course, you can use the tab complete to make this go faster. So for me, that's my downloads directory. Um, and then you can just start typing JPL and hit tab, and it should auto-populate. So there are two JPL Horizons Ephemeris folders. That's redundant. But now we can go into the second one. And then from here, we are going to type reg svr32. And that's our registration command. From there, um, you can once again just type jp, hit tab, and it'll automatically recognize the .vbs file. We don't want to use the .vbs file, so you actually want to hit tab again and make sure that you're getting the .wsc file. Now, once you can see this command like I have it here, 
go ahead and hit enter and you should get a, a successful box saying that this UI plugin has been registered. So now we're finally ready to open up SDK and actually load in our comment. So I already have SDK open to the splash screen and I'm gonna create a new scenario. Um, we'll give it a descriptive name. In this case, I'm looking at the NeoWise comment. So I'm gonna call it uh, NeoWise Visibility. Now make sure that um, the scenario times are um, the timing that you want for your analysis time period. I'm just looking for today to four days from now. And then we can go ahead and create. So now I have a fresh SDK scenario. The first thing I'm gonna do is configure my windows to be exactly as I want them. So we won't be needing a 2D graphics window for this scenario, so I'm gonna go ahead and just close that. I'm gonna maximize the 3D graphics window so that we can get as good of a view as we possibly can. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and click this button right up here, 3D graphic windows central body, and change that to sun. Because we're doing a heliocentric um, orbit here, and so I wanna be able to center in on the sun. Um, the next thing I'm going to do, just for later sake, is open the globe manager and remove the moon so that I can declutter the labels that we'll see later on. Um, and then finally, open up the properties of the 3D graphics window, go down to advanced, and change this max visible distance to something um, a little bit larger so that I can zoom out far and still see all of the objects in my 3D graphics window. Um, once I've changed this to a, a large number, I can just go ahead and close out the properties, and that should be all the configuration we need for the 3D graphics window there. Next thing I'm gonna do is insert four planet objects. So uh, that'll be the Sun, the Earth, Mercury, and Venus. Um, these will be useful for us to visualize the orbit that NeoWise is in, just to give us some more context. So to do that, I'm gonna open up um, the Insert SDK Objects tool. I'm gonna choose Planet, and then choose Insert Default, and I'm gonna hit Insert four times. Now I can see I have four default planets and they're all actually on the sun right now. So I'll open the properties of each one and you can see this auto rename button here is already enabled. What that'll do is when I choose a central body, it'll automatically rename my object to the name of that central body and put it at the correct location. So I'm gonna do the sun, the earth, Mercury, and Venus. Now I'm gonna left click on the earth and then shift click down to Venus so that I can edit the properties of all three of these objects at once. And I'm gonna go into their properties, into 3D graphics attributes, uncheck inherit from 2D planet graphics, and unclutter this a little bit. So we're gonna to wanna to show the inertial position of these planets, we're gonna to wanna to show their orbits, and we're gonna to wanna to show their labels, and that's it. So I'm gonna go ahead and check those three boxes, and then hit OK. And now you can see in my 3D graphics window that I have the sun the Earth, Venus, and Mercury all here for a little bit of spatial awareness. Now one cool thing I'm gonna do to make sure I'm looking directly down on the ecliptic plane of the sun is go up to this button here, View From Two, and click the arrow next to it and open up uh, the, the View From Two box here. So I wanna go a longer direction from the sun and I'm gonna select the uh, Z component of the ecliptic uh, J2000 axes for the sun just as you can see here. So true eclipse, J2000, axes, and the Z axis. And then I'm gonna select inwards that we're looking down on the ecliptic plane since the Z axis comes up out of it. And you'll see we have a perfect top down view of this ecliptic plane. So now we're all set up, we're ready to insert our comet and have good spatial awareness here. So we're gonna go to insert and we're gonna use a satellite to model the comet, um, but this really is just for orbit purposes. Um, we're gonna go ahead and define its properties and click insert. Now, um, the UI plugin that we're gonna use is an SDK external propagator. So we're gonna select propagator and then SDK external. Under ephemeris type, we're gonna bring up this dropdown menu and you should see JPL Horizons ephemeris reader. If you don't see this here, you need to go back to the FAQ about registering your UI plugin and go through all those steps again. Um, that's probably the issue. But in this case, we're gonna select JPL Horizons ephemeris reader and now for file name, we're gonna go back to that text file that we generated when we were on the JPL Horizons website that should be in our downloads. As you can see right here, horizonsresults.txt, that should be exactly the file that you're gonna see in your download as well. I'm gonna go ahead and open that and then click apply. And what this will do is it'll take all of the ephemeris data that's in that text file and it'll put it straight into SDK and propagate the orbit for us for our time period. And I'll close out of all this and here you can see the orbit that that comet is predicted to have within our inner solar system. 
So I'm going to go ahead and change a few properties here just so that we can make sure that we see where the comet is along this track. First thing I'm going to do is rename this satellite. Um, it's never good to have default names on your objects. So I'm going to call it NeoWise. Then I'm going to go ahead and open its properties. And we're going to scroll down to 3D graphics and a model. And so what I'm going to do first is just deselect the detail thresholds. What that'll do is it'll say that no matter how far you zoom out, you'll still be able to see the satellite's location. Um, and so if I click Apply and go back into my 3D graphics window, now I can actually see where in this orbit NeoWise is currently. And so I can go to, for example, 23rd of July, and I'll just go to zeros UTC. And this is the day that's expected to be the closest approach between NeoWise and the Earth that's still remaining. And so here, um, I can see that that close approach. It's still 0.7 AU away, so obviously we're not in any danger, um, but it's cool to see this, this spatial awareness here, here in the 3D graphics window. So another cool option that we have is to change the model itself. Since obviously we're using a satellite object for a comet, that doesn't really feel right. And so one thing that we can do is, uh, is go into our um, model files, and there are a bunch of default options here that we have. For example, um, you can choose arrows, and then if we were to uh, right-click on NeoWise in the object browser and click Zoom to, you can see we have this model of Eros here, which is you know, much more accurate than just a satellite. And so if you're making visualizations out of this scenario, this would definitely be something that you want to do. Um, you can play around with lighting as well. Um, if you want to click the flashlight, unclick the flashlight. And, uh, and you can change lighting properties as well in the 3D graphics window. You can enable lighting effects or disable them. So another option that we have, um, I have some cool models that we have internally here. And so I'm going to go ahead and insert one of those um, so we can see what a nice high fidelity asteroid model looks like. As you can see, it's a lot better than just the simple ones that, that come with SDK. But this is just opening your eyes to the, uh, the opportunities that exist with bringing in plenty of different 3D models into SDK which will be the topic of another video. And so since NeoWise is coming so, uh, so close to us, 0.7 AU, this week, um, and you can actually go out and see it with the naked eye, I'm gonna show you how you can determine from where you are what directions to look and when if you wanted to see NeoWise or any other comet or asteroid you wanna to load to SDK. The first thing I'm gonna do is add a facility object. I'm gonna open up the Insert SDK Objects browser, click on Facility, and Insert Default. What that'll do in this case is just insert a facility at AGI headquarters here in Exton, which works perfectly for me because that's where I am. Um, if you are not, which you probably aren't, you can open up the properties of this facility and uh, change the geodetic lat long to wherever you're going to be observing your asteroid or comet from. I'm going to make sure I give it a name, always name your objects. And then I'm going to go ahead and compute access between this facility and the NeoWise object itself. What I'm going to do is go ahead and put in some constraints um, because we obviously can't view the comet when it's daytime here. Um, and it's even better if we can view the comet where it's nighttime here or it, we're in Umbra and the comet itself is in direct sunlight. So we're going to add some constraints to reflect that. So what I'm going to do is open up the properties for AGI. I'm going to scroll down to Constraints, Sun, enable the lighting box, and then select Umbra. That's to reflect the fact that we want to be in Umbra when we're observing this comet. And then I'm going to go into the NeoWise properties and go down to, again, Constraints, Sun, enable the lighting option, and then select Direct Sun, which is the default. Now when I hit OK, um, we've accurately reflected all of the constraints that we have in this situation. And so we'll go ahead and compute our access. So we're going to use the Access tool. And we'll open that up. We'll select our object to be AGI, which is the viewer. And then we'll select NeoWise as the target and hit Compute. So this will give us all of the accesses where we are in Umbra and the comet itself is still in direct sunlight. So then I'm going to go down to Reports in the bottom right, and I'm going to select AER. That's for Azimuth Elevation and Range. Azimuth is essentially the direction with which you're looking on the ground. So 0 degrees would be directly north, whereas 180 degrees would be south. And then Elevation is at what elevation in the sky you're looking at at that azimuth. So a zero degree azimuth would be north and a 20 degree elevation would be 20 degrees up in the sky directly north. Range, of course, is how far away this object is. So we'll generate that report. And what this will give us is all of the access intervals that we have subject to our constraints within the time period that we specified. The start of this first access interval on the 23rd of July is at 2100 UTC 
that lines up with um, sunset. And so this is about an expected result. And so one thing I'll notice here is that the elevation starts at almost 37 degrees and continually goes down. And so what this tells me is that if I want to get the best view of this comet, I want to be outside for sunset, watch sunset, and then I can uh, get a very high view of it in the sky and then watch it come down. And so this is how I can go ahead and determine what axis intervals I will have for the comet from where I am. And I would encourage you to go do the same thing. Um, that way you can go out at the right time, make sure you're looking in the right direction and get the best possible view of this thing. Um, you'll only have to wait 6,800 years if you miss it. So maybe that's a little bit of motivation. And with that, I would encourage you guys to go try all the things you've seen in this video today. We have a wealth of FAQs, um, blogs, and how-tos on our website. And we're always here if you ever need any support. So with that, thank you and have a good day.